All right, you guys, as you can see by the thumbnail, I'm back with another one like the other one. Before I get into this story, let me just start this out first by saying I hope everybody enjoyed their Valentine's Day and I hope everybody did something special for your significant other. As for the 49ers, we're not going to talk about that. I'm still in grieving and it is what it is. Anyways, let me get to this next story. So this next story took place in, in Lancaster. This is during the time when the yards were still empty and they had just started bringing in buses and filling up the yards. So when they first open up a prison like this, they start bringing in buses from all the different institutions. Depending on what kind of prison it is and depending on the level, they start bringing in buses from everywhere. But during those first two or three weeks when they first opened up this prison, they started bringing in a lot of buses from Old Folsom and Pelican Bay. Because this also happened around the same time when they flipped Old Folsom and they converted it to a lower security prison. So a lot of the inmates that were there that had high points, they ended up getting shipped out to Lancaster. So my source who ran with the white guys, who I'm now going to refer to as Rebel, he was on one of the first buses that landed in Lancaster from Old Folsom. When you have a new prison that opens up like this, there's open real estate. Everybody's trying to find their handball courts, their benches, their tables, where they're going to sit at in the chow hall what side of the building they're going to sit on, what area of the yard they're going to kick it in. All the different groups out there, the Blacks, the Whites, the Norteños, the Sureños, the others. This is a new prison, so everybody's trying to acclimate themselves and, and secure their areas. When Rebel got there, all these things were still in the process of being established. So at some point, you know, Rebel's out there on the yard and these buses are pulling up from different prisons. There was a wood by the name of Dino from San Fernando that was on one of the buses that came from Pelican Bay. And you know, even though Pelican Bay isn't what it used to be, everybody's all spread out now. The level fours have a lot of the, the leadership on, on those yards. Pelican Bay is still a prison where, you know, when a bus pulls up, you know, you can best believe those that were involved in the politics out there on the yard, they were out there and they were paying closer attention to those buses because obviously they would want to know if somebody with status pulled up or somebody that they might know. So this wood Dino, he apparently he arrives with a hot kite. He gets there and he has a one time with them. Now, I don't know how long after he got there that he exposed this. I would imagine that he gets there, he gets housed. He makes his rounds on the yard. He sees who's out there and, you know, he allows himself to get somewhat comfortable before he just starts exposing that, hey, I got a hot kite with me and it's from such and such. So I would imagine he had his feelers and his spidey senses turned all the way up before, you know, he let anybody know that he was in possession of this this one time. The kite was in regards to an individual that they called hard guy from Lomita. The issue stemmed from personal dealings Hard Guy had with an AB member by the name of John Stinson years prior. I met John Stinson in the late 90s in Pelican Bay Shoe. I was in the same pod with him and Kurt Turflinger. Both of them were my chess partners, and both of them were high-ranking Aryan Brotherhood members. So I knew who John Stinson was. But this individual hard guy apparently got into it with John Stinson. And then later on, they ended up crossing paths and they had words on one of the gray gooses, one of the buses. And according to my source, Rebel, hard guy failed to follow up on a directive that John Stinson gave him. And everything kind of went bad after that. At one time, hard guy was a loyal follower of the AB and was striving to become a member himself. However, he ended up getting crossed up with the AB. They put a green light on him and it followed him for years. So John Stinson, he ended up picking up a murder case. And during the time when he was in the L.A. County Jail fighting that case, he sent hard guy to his house on the streets with instructions to pick up the keys to his truck and to pick up an undisclosed amount of money to cop dope with. At the time, hard guy was doing bad. He wasn't mobile, so Stinson offered to let him use his truck. This was a favor Hard Guy was doing for Stinson. And at the time, Stinson probably didn't even care about the truck. He just wanted to get his hands on that dope. But Hard Guy was the only one that he had out there at that time that was willing to help him. 
And loaning him his truck was one of the things that he needed to do in order to get that dope. So that's what he did. Stinson tried to make this as easy as he possibly could for Hard Guy. Because again, he wanted that dope. Stinson tells Hard Guy, he's like, look, all you got to do is go by my lady's pad and she's going to give you the keys to my truck and she's going to give you the bread to cop the dope with. Take the truck, go do what you got to do, go cop the dope. And when you get it, just take it back, give it to my lady. And that's all you got to do. It's pretty simple, right? So he was supposed to use Stinson's truck to go cop the dope with. And then when he got the dope, he was supposed to take it back to Stinson's old lady. And she was going to give it to his attorney so that he could bring it to him in the county jail. Well, our guy, he goes by Stinson's pad and he meets with his old lady. She gives him the keys to the truck. She gives him the money for the dope and hard guy leaves, but he never comes back. He basically burned Stinson and then made no effort to reach back out and let him know what happened. He doesn't call his old lady. He does nothing. He just doesn't come back. From the sounds of it, he probably went on a sick one. He probably went and got the dope, started using it, started running, and then he goes MIA. He's out there for a couple of months driving around in Stinson's truck until he eventually ends up wrecking it. He crashes the truck and then he goes on his run. Hard guy, he spent a lot of time in prison. So he was well aware of how the AB, how they functioned, how they operated. He was more than familiar with that lifestyle. And he obviously knew that he was going to end up getting crossed up if, you know, he didn't give Stinson back his dope or he didn't return the truck. He knew that there was gonna be consequences, but he obviously, he didn't care. Or the dope just had him so twacked out that it just wasn't a priority no more. Either way, one thing's for sure, he definitely let his better judgment get away from him. So he ends up going MIA, he goes on the run, and then a couple months later, he ends up catching a hot one of his own. I'm not sure where he caught his hot one at. I don't know if it was in LA County or if it was in another county, but from the sounds of it, from what Rebel told me, it didn't sound like he crossed paths with Stinson in the L.A. County Jail or he had any issues while he was fighting his case. So I'm assuming that after Stinson ends up getting convicted on his case and after Hard Guy gets convicted on his case, that they get on a bus and they ended up running into each other. They see each other on one of the great gooses and they end up having words. They see each other and Stinson, he confronts them and the bus is headed for San Quentin. So obviously, I don't know what hard guy said. I don't know what, what his excuse or what his explanation was for burning Stinson and for crashing his truck. But the conversation ends up going all bad and Stinson ends up threatening hard guy in the bus. And he tells him something to the effect of, you obviously don't know who the fuck I am now. And I'm assuming that this is a reference to, you know, him becoming a newly made member of the Aryan Brotherhood. Our guy responds by telling Stinson, I don't give a fuck who you are. When we get to San Quentin, if you got a problem, deal with it. So at the time that they had words, Stinson was in one of the security cages that is up in the front of the bus. There's probably like six of those cages and they use these cages for guys that are going to the shoot program, higher security guys or Hannibal Lecter status. I had the luxury of riding in those cages every time I got on a Grey Goose because I was always going back to the shoot program. But that's where Stinson was at. Hard guy was probably like halfway back on the bus with everybody else. But they have the conversation openly in front of everybody on the bus. Everybody hears what they're saying. And Stinson, he probably didn't even care. He was probably still pissed off that he didn't get his dope. So according to Rebel, when they get to San Quentin, Hard Guy ends up getting his own yard and Stinson, he obviously ends up getting his own yard. Now, I'm not sure what happened when they got to San Quentin. I'm sure they crossed paths in r and &R. You know, when you get off the bus, you see everybody right there in r and &R. Because Stinson was in one of the security cages up front, more than likely they caged him in r and as well. And they put Hard Guy in one of the open cages with everybody else. But they still had an opportunity to cross paths. So I imagine they had more words when they were in r and 
but nothing obviously happened. So I don't know where they ended up getting housed at, but there's only so many yards in San Quentin. So if they both had a yard, one of them was obviously on the Sureño white yard and one of them had to be on the integrated yard. So I don't know where these guys ended up getting housed at, but there's only so many yards in San Quentin for ADSEG inmates. And I don't even know if Hard Guy went to ADSEG, but Rebel said that both of them ended up having a yard. So I would imagine that if they went to ADSEG, only one of them was on the white Sureño yard. The other one had to have been on the integrated yard. But what I'm assuming probably happened is Stinson probably got housed in ADSEG and they probably housed Hard Guy somewhere in the reception center. So the fact that Rebel told me that Hard Guy had a yard of his own, this tells me that, you know, despite the fact that the AB had a green light on him, he must have still been somebody with, with some status or somebody with, you know, a level of, of influence. And Rebel actually ended up confirming this. He told me that hard guy was, you know, he was a big dude. He was covered with ink. He, you know, he, he had an intimidating presence about himself. He had a big whip, you know, big yoked up cat. And, you know, the way he carried himself, he, he was just, he was a bully. That's the other thing that he did say about him. He, he, he conducted himself like a bully. He struck fear in a lot of the woods out there. That's why they respected him or that's why he was able to have that influence over him. You know, the other thing that Rebel said is that Hard Guy had the ability to still influence a lot of people. Matter of fact, he influenced Rebel, but I'll get into that later. The other thing that Rebel said about Hard Guy is that, you know, he had the ability to influence a lot of these white guys, even though at some point they would end up finding out that, you know, this guy was one of the Aryan Brotherhood's targets. He still was able to garner a lot of support out there. And it was probably because, you know, they feared him. That's what it was. He was a big dude that pushed his weight around. He was a bully. And he would land on these, these active level four yards. And these guys, they wouldn't move on him. They would let him coexist out there until, you know, the Aryan Brotherhood would eventually end up getting a line on him. And then they'd whack him. This included Rebel himself. He was able to influence him. But I'll get into that in a minute. So Rebel said that, you know, Stinson, he has his own yard. Hard guy, he's got his own yard. At some point, Stinson starts sending shooters at hard guy. He starts sending torpedoes out there to have him whacked. But hard guy, you know, he's not no dummy. He's been around. He's well-versed in this. He's been running for years. He knows what to look for. He knows all the red flags, all the signs. He sees these guys coming a mile away. He ends up sending everybody back to Stinson that he sends at him stabbed up. All the torpedoes, all the shooters that Stinson sent at Hard Guy, Hard Guy sends them all back stabbed up. And I'm sure a lot of these guys probably went out there as sleepers to whack Hard Guy. But something about the way they moved or what they did ended up exposing their hands and Hard Guy would detect them and then he would whack them. And this continued to happen over the years. This incident that happened in San Quentin, this was just one of many. But on some of these occasions when they would send torpedoes at Hard Guy, he would end up spotting the red flags first and he'd move first. In other instances, he wouldn't get so lucky. They would end up whacking him. So I don't know how it ended up playing out between Hard Guy and John Stinson when they were in San Quentin. But fast forward a few years later, Hard guy ends up landing in Lancaster. He's out there on the yard with Rebel. And now Dino pulls up and he has this kite that says hard guy's got a green light on him. So hard guy, he's there in Lancaster. But now the, the dynamics of prison politics have changed drastically. Everybody has cell phones now. And it's kind of hard to slip through the cracks or to hide on an active yard. Now everybody has cell phones. So it's kind of hard to slip through the cracks or hide out on an active yard like he had done so many other times in the past. Everything's done in real time, including the screening process and the filtering out of new arrivals. And like all the other organizations out there on these yards, the Aryan Brotherhood had a presence or a following out there as well. And now again, they finally get a line on hard guy. 
they get word that he lands over there in Lancaster and they send Dino over there with the kite to have him knocked down. So Hard Guy, he ends up selling up with my source, Rebel. And because they're sellies, Hard Guy obviously brings Rebel up to speed on what's happened with him in the past. This isn't only done out of respect, but it's also done because Hard Guy doesn't want Rebel to get blindsided or end up hearing it from somewhere else. So Hard Guy, he gives Rebel all the details. He tells him everything that happened with John Stinson. He tells him how he went over to his pad, how he picked up the keys to the truck, how he got the money for the dope, how he totaled the truck, how he never went back, and everything that happened on the bus, everything that happened in San Quentin, so on and so forth. He tells him everything. But he also tells Rebel that a lot of the facts have been distorted and taken out of context over the years. Kind of also leads him to believe that he didn't have any malicious intentions and he paints an entirely different picture. One that makes him look a lot less responsible than he really was. And one of the biggest misconceptions that he wanted to clear up is that he never spit on John Stinson. Supposedly, somebody had put it out there that during the time when they ran into each other on, on the bus and they had words, supposedly they were saying that when Hard Guy got up to get off the bus, that he walked by John Stinson and he spit in the cage. But Hard Guy, he adamantly denies it. He said, this is just somebody else that was telling the story and they ended up adding their own details to it. Hard Guy tells Rebel, this is somebody just trying to infuriate the Aryan Brotherhood even more. So when this Wood Dino shows up from Pelican Bay with this one time, which is prison slang for a kite, he gets at the Sureños and he brings them up to speed with what's going on. At the same time, Dino, he raises his hand and he said, he'll hit hard guy. He'll, he'll be the one to knock him down, but you know he needs their assistance with a banger. And when I heard this, one of the first questions that I had to Rebel was, if Hard Guy was a wood, why would he be getting at the Sureños and asking them for a weapon? Why wouldn't he just get at the other woods? Rebel said that Dino was being very selective about who he exposed this to. He wanted to be real discreet, especially when it came to the woods that were on the yard. That's why he went to the Sureños and asked them for their assistance. Because apparently, whatever AB member he was dealing with in Pelican Bay, whoever gave him that one time authorizing that green light, they apparently told Dino to be very cautious, to proceed with caution when dealing with Hard Guy. Because in the past, he had hit several individuals that they had sent out there to whack him. But they ended up leaving themselves wide open or they exposed themselves by telling somebody else and he ended up hearing about it, and then he would end up whacking them. So Dino was trying to avoid all that. His thinking was probably like, you know what? I'm just gonna go to the Sureños, get their assistance, get the banger, hit this individual, and be done with it. Dino probably figured, you know what? This individual had been warned too many times in the past. I'm not gonna take no chances with him. I'm just gonna deal with it like this. This way, it doesn't get leaked out. And then it all came down to hard guys still having some level of influence over a lot of the woods that were out there on these yards. And the Aryan Brotherhood knew that. And again, they're the ones that told Dino to proceed with caution because he had priors for striking first. So in the course of, of Dino approaching the, the Southsiders about assisting them with this weapon, he also tells them about the details of why they want Hard Guy hit, why the Aryan Brotherhood want him hit. He tells them everything that happened with John Stinson in the county jail and all the details that Dino was aware of himself. He relays all that to the Sureños that he approached. So Dino, he tells the Sureños that when all this happened, at the time when this happened, when Hard Guy burned John Stinson, John Stinson was working hand in hand with Guate from La Rana. They were working together in the LA County Jail and that Basically, this was both of their dope. So when Dino says that, this plants a seed in the minds of these Sureños that, well, this individual, he burned the Mexican mafia as well. He didn't just burn the Aryan Brotherhood, but he also burned the Mexican mafia. So this fool's definitely a target. But again, Dino raised his hand. He said he was going to deal with it. So problem solved. Now that he threw Guate's name out there, this obviously garnered a lot of support. And now 
the target on hard guy's back is starting to grow. So the Sureños, they end up assisting Dino. They they give him a banger. Dino gets the banger and he basically tells them, he's like, you know what, give me a few days. Let me let me figure this out. I'm going to figure out the best time and place to hit this individual. I'll keep you guys in the loop. And that's basically where, where they left it. But keep in mind, hard guy's not standing alone. He's been on the yard for a while now. And he's been able to use his influence to establish an alliance around him, including my source, Rebel, who was his celly at that time. Rebel knew that he burned John Stinson, but Rebel was like, you know what? Fuck it, I'm going to ride with you. If you go down, I'm going to go down with you. Rebel was young at the time. He was easily influenced, like a lot of the other woods were that were out there on the yard. They bought into his image. They bought into the way that he carried himself. Otherwise, they would have understood that there were long-term consequences that came with backing up somebody like Hard Guy that had issues with the Aryan Brotherhood, period. This would have put him and anyone else that would have rolled with Hard Guy right in the hat with them. But again, Hard Guy wasn't no dummy by a long shot. He had been put in this position many times before in the past. And he knew what he needed to do in order to build an alliance around himself and to basically keep himself insulated because of this green light that the Aryan Brotherhood had put on him for years. But those alliances weren't just with the woods. He also made small alliances with some of the Sureños that were out there on the yard as well. Matter of fact, one of the Sureños that was out there on the yard that he'd gotten real tight with is the one that told him that Dino was making plans to hit him and that he had a kite authorizing a green light on him. You know, one of, one of Dino's own indiscretions that kind of tipped his hand and led Hard Guy to believe that he was up to no good isn't what Dino was doing outwardly. It's what he wasn't doing that raised red flags. When Dino first got to the yard, he made his rounds. He introduced himself to everybody. And it was the lack of interaction with Hard Guy that kind of tipped his hand and led him to believe that Dino was up to something. You know, when you got a target like that, you're supposed to rock him to sleep. You're supposed to interact with them, make them feel comfortable. You don't play keep away with them or avoid them when you see them on the yard. That's going to let them know that you're up to something. And that's what Dino did. And this wasn't a smart move on Dino's part, especially when dealing with a seasoned individual like Hard Guy, who had developed a keen eye for these types of things over the years. Hard Guy seen Dino coming a mile away. So when Hard Guy catches wind about what's going on, he starts to strategize his next move. But keep in mind, neither Rebel or Hard Guy knew that the Sureños had assisted Dino with the piece. They didn't know that he was already strapped up. But at this stage, it didn't really matter. They knew they'd eventually have to hit Dino, but at that time, it just wasn't the right time. And this was based on several other factors. Opportunity, what was going on on the yard at that time, other internal issues. So they decided to just strap up and keep their ear to the ground. They just decided to wait until they got all their ducks in order. And that's what they did. So for the next three yards, they strapped up and they basically braced themselves for Dino's next move. Dino, on the other hand, got himself a job as a building porter, which worked to his advantage because this allowed him to go in and out of his building at will. Whenever he wanted to go out to the yard or come back in the building, all he had to do was yell up at the control booth and they popped the door open for him. So over the course of the next couple of yards, Hard Guy pays close attention to Dino's movements. Whenever they go out there to the yard, he watches his routines, his habits, what he does when he's out there. And this is important because whenever there's a break in the monotony, this usually means there's a cause for concern. But Hard Guy also determines that there's another wood out on the yard by the name of Winchester from the Lancaster area that was either going to assist Dino as a second shooter or was going to be involved in some kind of way. Whatever his role was going to be, Hard Guy felt confident that he was lining up to be involved. But even though Hard Guy is making these observations when he's out there on the yard, him and Rebel, they still hold firm. They continue to go out there strapped up but they just kick back and they wait. So on the third day at the end of yard, when they go back in the building, Rebel, he gets it hard guy when they get back in the cell and he tells him, he's like, hey brother, he's like, I can't do this no more. 
He's like, you know, we've been going to the yard for three days straight, strapped up. I can't handle the stress of going out there four days in a row if we're not going to hit somebody. If, I, if I'm going to carry a piece out there tomorrow, we're stabbing somebody. Otherwise, I'm going to slide back because I can't deal with this stress. And I understood what Rebel was talking about when he said he was stressed out, you know, after carrying a weapon for three days and they still haven't hit their target. This means you got to go out to the yard and you got to play keep away with the yard officers. You got yard officers that roam the yard and they're randomly searching people, trying to catch somebody slipping, somebody that's out there strapped up. You could be on the handball court and they'll walk over there and they'll line everybody up on the wall and they'll shake everybody down. They'll pat them down to see if they can find a weapon. So when you're out there walking around on the yard and you got a weapon, you basically got to keep your eyes on the yard officers and make sure that you try to avoid them the best way you can. Sometimes they're not avoidable. Sometimes, you know, they might try to walk you down and search you. And if that happens, you're going to get rolled up. They're going to throw you in the hole and you're going to get charged with possession of a weapon. But Rebel, he also tells hard guy like this. He's like, look, man, the other thing is this. You know, if we go out there tomorrow, four days in a row, and we're strapped up, and let's just say hypothetically, they walk up on us and we get patted down and they find out, they find the weapons, we get rolled up. That's going to look like a PC move. If we don't go out there and stab somebody tomorrow, then I'm done. He tells hard guy, I got your back. I'm riding with you. But if we go out there tomorrow with weapons, we're stabbing somebody or I'm sliding back. I'm not doing it for four days, five days in a row. And we're not doing nothing out there. So hard guy gives him his word. He's like, look, tomorrow we're stabbing somebody. We're going to hit somebody. Don't trip. I got you. I give you my word. So Rebel, he tells hard guys like, that's what I wanted to hear. It's all good. Tomorrow, let's go out there. Let's do our thing. So that was the plan. And Rebel's right because, you know, that's a common tactic that a lot of guys try to play on the yard. If they're told to go stab somebody and, you know, they're one of the shooters and they don't want to do it for whatever reason, they don't want to catch time or they're just scared to do it. They're scared of the gun tower, whatever reason it may be. They'll do something to purposely get themselves shaken down so that that weapon is found before they blast their target. That's a common tactic that you see all the time. You'll see guys that are given a target walking the track for no reason. Like, hey, come search me so that I don't got to do this. Instead of going from point A to point B, they're purposely walking around on the yard trying to make themselves seen as much as they can so that they can get shook down and rolled up. That's a way of getting out of having to stab somebody. And like Rebel said, it, it's a PC tactic. So there's another wood named Big George that apparently had the keys to the building that Hard Guy and Rebel were in. So when Big George is making his rounds in that building, he stops by Rebel and Hard Guy's door and he slides a kite under their door. And it ends up being from Dino. So Dino and Hard Guy, they obviously, they open up the kite. And Dino makes a quick introduction and then he gets straight to it. And he says something to the effect of, he's like, hey, check it out. He's like, you know, I heard that there's some people that are spreading some bullshit rumors about me on the yard. Then he says, we can talk about it or we can handle it, whatever you want to do. And then he signs off. Needless to say, this ramped up everything a couple of notches. And under the circumstances, this went from laying back, trying to calculate your next best move to now dealing what's become an immediate threat. Dino basically called hard guy out and tells him to go out to the yard so that they can deal with it. But either way, tomorrow's day four and Rebels already let it be known that they're doing something when they go out to the yard tomorrow or he's sliding back. So hard guy knows he's about to lose his support. So I'm sure hard guy knew that something was going to have to happen on the next yard or he was going to lose his support. So boom, the next day they go out to the yard and I don't know how they got split up. I don't know why hard guy was out there before rebel got out there or at what point they split up, but rebel is walking the track 
but he ends up seeing hard guy and Dino engaged in a deep conversation and they're walking laps. This definitely came as a surprise to Rebel. He definitely wasn't expecting this. So as Rebel's walking the track, one of the Sureños walks up and hands him hard guy's piece. Now Rebel's confused. He's standing there, he's got two weapons, he's all dressed up, and he ain't got nowhere to go. But not only that, Hard Guy and Dino are walking the track like they're best friends. Rebel doesn't know what to think, but he just starts laughing. He's like, man, this is a joke. I've been doing this shit for the last couple of days just so these two cats can come out here and be peacemakers. He's like, man, this shit's crazy. Man, this shit's wild. I don't know what kind of freak show I got myself caught up in, but I'm cool. So a few minutes later, after the first Sureño comes up and gives Rebel Hard Guy's weapon, another Sureño named Loco from Los Compadres comes up and he retrieves both weapons. Rebel don't know what's going on, but he just hands both weapons to him and he just continues to walk the track. But the Sureños were taking a different position now. You guys got to remember that when Dino initially approached the Sureños about assisting them with the, with the weapon, that he not only gave them the impression that Hard Guy burned the Aryan Brotherhood, but he gave them the impression that he also burned the Mexican Mafia, Cuate from La Rana to be specific. There just so happened to be a couple of Sureños that were on that yard that were there in the county jail when John Stinson and Cuate were both there. And although they didn't know the intricate details of you know, whether or not Hard Guy burned just the Aryan Brotherhood or whether he burned the Aryan Brotherhood and the Mexican Mafia, but they were going to find out. They had an open line to Cuate, and they intended to find out. So one of their communication links, he strikes up a one time, and they shoot it to Cuate. He basically tells Cuate that hard guy's there, and he asks for clarification on how to proceed. Cuate, on the other hand, he responds immediately, and he basically sends word back telling them to unalive hard guy. This obviously changed the dynamics of the whole scenario. And this was something that even Hard Guy himself didn't even anticipate. I'm not sure what the dialogue was between Hard Guy and Dino and why Dino ultimately decided to defy a directive coming from the Aryan Brotherhood. But in the end, whatever was said, whether it was because Dino was influenced by Hard Guy or he was influenced by something else, they ultimately decided to squash it. And that's what they did. Maybe Dino got scared. Maybe he got cold feet. I don't know what it was, but they squashed it. So fast forward around two months later. It's sometime around Christmas of 1995. Rebels on the yard with Hard Guy, and there's a couple other woods that are there with them, and they're doing their daily pull-up and push-up routine. There was also about five or six Sureños that were to the side of them doing their own push-up routine. They were also working out right there. And this was something that they used to do daily on the yard. So this wasn't nothing out of the ordinary. This was a daily routine. So they're out there on the yard working out like they do every day. And there's no reason to sense that there's anything going on. There's no friction out there on the yard. There's no animosity out there. There's nothing happening at that time. There was... A couple of guys going to canteen out there on the yard. Other than that, there's nothing going on. It was just another uneventful day. So this is two months later. And the situation that happened with Hard Guy and Dino, everybody's dropped their guard by now, including Hard Guy. Everybody was under the impression that it got squashed. And that was the end of it. So Rebel, he remembers the day that everything happened like it was yesterday. He said it was overcast out. It looked like it was getting ready to rain. In his words, he said it was a gray ass day. People were standing in front of canteen, getting their canteen draws. There was a couple people going out for a visit. But other than that, there was nothing happening out there. And according to Rebel, the program office, the MTA, and the canteen were all in close proximity to each other. Rebel said he remembers encouraging Hard Guy to do a set. They were doing pull-ups and push-ups, one up, one down. Rebel said he remembers telling Hard Guy something to the effect of, come on, man, quit shamming. At that point, Hard Guy stops talking. He jumps up on the pull-up bar to do his next set, 
and Rebel goes down to do his set of push-ups. So when Hard Guy was stretched out doing his set of pull-ups, a Sureño named Chan from White Fence walks up and he hits Hard Guy in the chest. And another Sureño named Spooky from Echo Park, he walks up behind Hard Guy and he hits him in the back. They do it almost simultaneously. It was fast, but it was brutal. And they both plugged him about three or four times each. So the next thing Rebel remembers is going down to do his set of push-ups. And then he hears a skirmish and a bunch of footsteps behind him. When he turned to see what was going on, everybody had already dispersed. The only one that was there was Hard Guy. So he sees Hard Guy laid out under the pull-up bar. Everybody was gone except him. It happened that fast. At first, Rebel didn't even know what happened. It took a minute for everything to register. Then he seen the blood and he realized that Hard Guy was leaking and that he was in bad shape. The tower must have either seen it or he seen Hard Guy laid out, but he hit the alarm. So Rebel, he walks over there to Hard Guy, even though everybody else is proning out on the yard. He walks over there. That's his boy. He walks over there and he could tell as soon as he was standing over Hard Guy that he was in bad shape because he could hear the blood gurgling in, in his chest, probably the result of a punctured lung. So as Rebel went to help Hard Guy get up so he could carry him to the MTA, he asked Hard Guy, he's like, hey, who did it? Who did this to you? Hard Guy immediately said, Chan and Spooky. Chan and Spooky did it. So keep in mind, Hard Guy's a big boy. He was probably about 6'1", 240, 250 pounds. So he wasn't easy to carry. But Rebel was able to carry him to the MTA and hand him off to medical staff that already had the door propped open and were waiting for him. They obviously heard the alarm go off, and I would imagine they probably summoned them out to the yard. But when they opened up the door, they seen Rebel carrying Hard Guy to the door. So they just opened up the door, and he handed him off to him. Then he walked back out to the yard, and he proned out. Everybody on the yard, including the gun tower, seen Rebel carry Hard Guy to the MTA. Everybody seen it. No doubt, it was a blessing that the MTA was in close proximity to where this happened. Otherwise, Hard Guy might not have been so lucky. So for the next hour, they went through the meticulous process of stripping, handcuffing, and escorting everybody off the yard back to their assigned buildings one by one until the entire yard was cleared. And here's the thing, whenever you have a stabbing like this, if the victim and the two shooters that were involved are all from the same ethnicity and are all affiliated with the same group, nine times out of 10, they'll slam the yard down for the rest of the day. And in the morning, they'll let everybody resume program. They'll look at it as routine house cleaning, internal issues that need to happen in the day-to-day -day prison politics. But when you have a victim and two shooters that are from a different ethnicity and are affiliated with different groups, it gets a little bit more complicated. That's cause for concern and the administration will usually slam the prison down so that they could run an investigation. They're going to want to find out if this is something that's going to continue to escalate and why it happened. And on the other side of it, this obviously caused a lot of tension. This wasn't a sanctioned hit. Keep in mind that the Woods, they had no idea that Chan and Spooky were going to hit Hard Guy. So I'm sure the sentiment on the yards as far as the woods were concerned was, it's on. It's on and crack. So according to Rebel, there was a Sureño on the yard named Coco from Hawaiian Gardens that was involved in some kind of shakeup with the Sureño leadership. He had the ability to take the Yavero position and run the yard, but he was advised not to because of some internal drama that was taking place amongst them. That's a story for another day. But according to Rebel, he was also close to Coco and he also advised Coco not to take that position. I doubt that Coco's position to slide back was just based on the advice that Rebel was giving him. But he obviously knew that there was a lot of shit going on on that yard and that it was probably best to just assist whoever was in charge out there at that time. But Coco obviously still had enough pull and influence to make sure that Rebel didn't face any repercussions for helping hard guy off the yard. Because this is the thing, there's a lot of Sureños that were on that yard that weren't feeling the fact that Rebel helped hard guy to the MTA. 
everybody on the yard, everybody that was out there, they seen Rebel help Hard Guy make it to the MTA. And, you know, you got to, you guys got to keep in mind, they got a directive from Guate to unalive this dude. So Rebel's actions were counterproductive to what they were trying to do. They were trying to take his win and Rebel, he saved him. But even though this didn't go over well with a lot of Sureños that were out there on the yard, Coco still had enough influence to make sure that nothing happened to Rebel. Coco basically tells the other Southsiders out there that they can't hold him accountable for that. These guys are sellies. And, you know, he didn't know that we were going to hit this guy. So how are we going to whack him for trying to help his own people? At any rate, nothing ended up happening to Rebel. In fact, Coco was the one that alerted Rebel that Dino had pulled up with the one time to have his celly hard guy whacked and that the Sureños had assisted Dino with a weapon. He's the one that told him. And then as this situation got more complicated and Coco found out that Rebel was the target Selly, he ultimately was also the one that told the Sureños to get the peace back from Dino and that they were in violation for assisting him with the weapon in the first place. Coco did this because he didn't want Rebel to get hurt or caught up in hard guys issues. But according to Rebel, it wasn't just the fact that they gave Dino the weapon. Coco apparently told the other Sureños on the yard that they were never to assist any woods with weapons on that yard moving forward. So they basically got in trouble for assisting the woods with the weapon. On a side note, it's crazy how much politics have changed. The Sureños in the woods used to have a strong alliance at one time, but it's obvious that over the years, these alliances have deteriorated. So as far as Coco, he was supposedly real tight with another well-known Mexican mafia member by the name of Mariano Martinez, Chewy from v &E. Coco was even slated to become the godfather of Chewy's newborn son. So just the mere association to Chewy alone gave Coco a lot of latitude on these yards. So after Rebel dodges two bullets and comes out of this situation unscathed, he was still getting ready to do something that would have ended up getting him caught up anyway. Like I said in the beginning, initially, probably due to his lack of schooling, he was going to ride it out with the Selly Hard guy in Wagdino, who was a torpedo that was sent by the Aryan Brotherhood. The Aryan Brotherhood would have made sure that Rebel would have been put in the hat for backing up Hard Guy without a doubt. But Rebel gets lucky and that whole situation is averted. Then the Sureños end up blindsiding Hard guy, and he ends up getting blasted by himself. Rebel then carries Hard Guy off the yard, which ends up getting him caught up anyway. But his boy Coco steps in and helps him dodge the second bullet. Rebel should have realized the gravity of his missteps at that point, and he should have took all this in as some valuable learning experiences. But after Hard Guy gets hit, Rebel and another Wood, who he doesn't want to name, we're gearing up to blast Chan and Spooky for hitting Hard Guy. Again, this was just a lack of schooling. Rebel's heart was in the right place for wanting to back up his celly. That's usually what you do. You back your celly up. You don't let your celly go down by himself. However, when these types of politics are involved, you got to step back or you got to ask yourself if this is worth you losing your career over. It's a tough decision to make, but you got to be smart about something like that. So Big George was another wood that had the keys for the woods in the building that Rebel was in. So as Rebel and his celly were in their cell plotting to stab Spooky and Chan, Big George was making his rounds in the building. He would make his rounds in the building and he would talk to all the woods. That's what he used to do. Make sure that they didn't need nothing. Make sure that everything was copacetic like that. But on this given day, Big George sensed that something was wrong. He walks up to Rebel's door and he basically says, what the fuck do you think you guys are going to do? And Rebel tells him, he says, we're going to stab Spooky and Chan. They hit one of our people. So Big George says, so what? You guys want to end up in the same predicament that he's been in for the last 15 years? He's been hit on damn near every yard he's been on. He got himself in hot water. None of that's your business. So Big George apparently talks some sense in the Rebel and his celly. And one of the best things that Rebel did for himself was to take heed to everything that Big George told him. Hard Guy ended up recovering from his injuries before they shipped him out to another prison. 
They tried to PC him up, but he refused to go out like that. He had heart, and for over 15 years, he kept going out to these active yards, despite the fact that the Aryan Brotherhood still had a presence out there, and despite the fact that there was a threat. Finally, not long after this, and after another failed attempt in Calipatria on Hard Guy's life, they finally ended up PCing him. He continued to fight it, but eventually they forced his hand, even though he continued to request to continue going out to active yards. And in the end, he had no choice. He had to come to terms with it and make the best out of the situation he was in. As far as Rebel, Rebel was a loyal friend of Hard Guy's and almost ended up becoming collateral damage. You know, loyalty is something that's hard to find, especially nowadays. People will turn on you over the drop of a dime. Whether it's over envy, jealousy, hate, or ill will, there's just not too many people out there who are genuine when it comes to real loyalty. <laughs> I've learned this time and time again, and I'm sure all of you can relate to what I'm saying. How many people can you count that you really feel are loyal friends? I can count mine on one hand and still have two or three fingers that I don't need. Rebel's loyalty was genuine, but in the realm of prison politics, he was blind. In the end, he was finally shaken out of that abstracted walking coma he was in, and he finally realized the severity of his mistakes. I hope you guys enjoyed this episode of Paradigm Profiles. If you guys like this story, give it a thumbs up. If you didn't like this story, give it a thumbs down. But either way, drop a comment and let me know what you think about this story. As always, thank you for the positive push. Thank you for supporting the channel, for continuing to support us, and just for being loyal viewers. Until the next one, this your boy B, and I'm out.